All right, welcome everyone to another webinar from your CSU Extension Horticulture Group. Um, I'd just like to welcome all of you here today. And I wanna start by thanking the Loveland Library and the Clearview Library in Windsor, the Northern Colorado Libraries collectively um, for helping us host these programs. Just to let you know, we are gonna be recording today's session. So don't feel like you have to write everything down. We're also gonna send you a follow-up email um, sometime in the next few days. And that will also have a link to that recording as well as a link to a survey that we are taking um, to find out what you wanna learn more about and how, your, um, how these webinars are going for you. So thanks for joining today for Home Landscape Irrigation Efficiency with Dr. Allison O'Connor. We are delighted to have her talk to you today. She is a wealth of knowledge. She holds several degrees from Ohio State, Iowa State, and CSU for her PhD. She's an avid golfer. She loves lawns. And she recently, I'm very jealous, she recently went to Augusta, Georgia the week before the Masters to peruse the grounds and look at all the amazing turf that they have and plants that they have and the azaleas were blooming. So um, it was really great for her to get to do that. So she loves lawns. She's here to talk to you more about that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Allison and we'll get started. Thanks Amy for being my co-pilot also to Tony and yes, Augusta, it was a religious experience. It was absolutely incredible. I spent the weekend with my mom, which was even more fun and I just can't even talk about it. But today we're gonna to talk about home irrigation efficiency. We're going to focus on lawns and landscapes and things that you can do to save water because I know it's all on the front forefront of our minds and we need to do our part in order to continue to have our beautiful landscapes. So like Amy said, this will be recorded. You'll get the link and I'll also mention a couple different publications that I'll include in the materials that I'll send out to everybody who's registered. We're going to start things off with about Colorado. So maybe you're just joining on us and if you're not familiar with Extension, know that we're your outreach arm of the university. We provide you with information that you can use every day. And we do get a lot of people moving to Colorado from other parts of the United States. So Colorado is considered a semi-arid state. Depending on where you live, you might get as little as six to eight inches of precipitation or maybe up to 15. I'm in Windsor, so just east of I-25, and what folks get in Loveland and Fort Collins is not what we see in Windsor. So even in a close geographic distance, it can absolutely vary. As we have increased populations, it's going to put more stretch and demand on our already waning water supply. So of course, we are dependent on snow for the most of our water that we use during our summer months. And so we always talk about snowpack, and there are people carefully monitoring that to make sure that we have enough water to not only flush the toilets, but also to grow our vegetables. And when you employ aspects of water-wise landscaping or xeriscaping, you can actually reduce your outdoor water use by up to 50 or 60 to 50%, which is absolutely incredible. So just by doing a few things, and that's what I really hope to share with you today, are some of these basic tips, these things that are easy, that don't seem daunting, of how you can actually start to save water in the landscape. So an interesting fact that you may not know is that only about 3% of all of the water in Colorado is used for landscapes. And with landscapes, we are including parks, golf courses, open space, home residences, um, vegetable gardens, sports complex, so 3% of our total water use is used for those areas. So really it's a pretty good return on investment. If you consider your own neighborhood or a park you visit, that is a great investment because we need to make sure we do have those green spaces for our communities and for our families. Another interesting fact is that about 60% of the water that originates in Colorado leaves our state. So it goes down slope, it goes to California. So we are left with about 40% of the total water that originates in Colorado. And then of that 3% is used for landscapes. What's amazing and what you should be really, really proud of is that in the last 10 years alone, Coloradans have decreased their per water consumption by 20%. So that is a huge statistic and you should all give yourselves a pat on the back, even if you've been here for just a couple of years, you are doing your part. So by installing those low flow 
shower sensors, low flow toilets, energy efficient or water efficient dishwashers, all of that adds up to make sure that we have water as a resource for the things that we need. So keep it up um, and keep doing a good job. It is true, however, that outdoor water, landscaping, lawns, vegetable gardens, use about 50% of your water budget during the summer months. As we get into the growing season, you'll be ramping up your sprinkler systems. You're going to have some outdoor plants and just know that about 50% of the water is used outdoors. And I'm sure you've all gotten notices from your own water districts. If you're not on a well and you're using city water, things are likely increasing for you uh, to your pocketbook this year. So water is expensive and that's why we need to use it wisely. So we can still have landscapes that are beautiful and places where we can recreate we can still grow vegetables. We just need to capitalize and utilize landscape irrigation that is efficient and using it in the smartest way possible. So when I talk about irrigation efficiency on the whole, what I'm talking about is applying the correct amount of water. So the water that the plant needs to the right place where the plant is located, at the right time, whether that's time of day or during the season, with the least amount of labor and cost. So we are approaching this from a sustainable aspect. We want to make sure that we're watering the lawns appropriately based on the season in April or May, lawns don't need as much. And then also making sure that we are watering where plants are located and not just spraying it everywhere. So that's the concept of irrigation efficiency that we will focus on today. Smart landscape design is also something to consider. And so I just talked to someone this morning who is looking to maybe convert aspects of her landscape. It's an older home, things are changing, there's a lot more shade. And so she's considering what she can do to actually make that a little bit more efficient. So when we're looking at landscape design, whether it's a brand new landscape or an existing landscape, we always want to make sure that we're using the right plant species. So it goes back to that right plant, right place. You can have turf in a semi-arid environment because we have kids and pets and this is where they recreate, this is where we play. It's not fun to play soccer on rocks, it's not fun for dogs to run around on rocks either. So turf can have a place, we just need to make sure that it's a practical use. We are also going to be using hydrozones and essentially what that means is we're grouping like plants together. So plants with similar water needs is what we want to put in spots. So planting your vegetable garden and having it on the same zone as your water-wise landscape doesn't make sense because they have different water needs. And then we should always, if we can, and this isn't possible in my own landscape, uh, try to have your turf zone separate from your landscape beds or your vegetable garden. I moved into a house, the irrigation was already established and it is something I need to address, but I have a vegetable garden that runs on the same zone as half of my lawn. So not ideal. Uh, looking back, that would have been a good thing to make that vegetable garden a separate zone itself. Properly designed irrigation systems, again, try to separate those landscape beds from your turf and your vegetables. And what the goal is with irrigation is that you should irrigate enough so that you don't have runoff. You don't want to see runoff onto the street or the sidewalk, but you do want to try to saturate as much of the soil profile as you can. And in, uh, and in landscape beds, you'll want to utilize, if possible, drip irrigation, or you could use a hose and sprinkler. That is also a very efficient way to water, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Let's start things off with lawn irrigation. It's the biggest chunk because I think lawns kind of are a mystifying way to water for a lot of people. And so what I really want you to take home today is this. The easiest way to water your lawn is to learn to operate your irrigation clock. And I know you look at your clock, it might have a lot of numbers and dials and zones and buttons, but really if you can learn to turn it on and off, that is a great feat because a lot of times our clocks are turned on when we ramp up our irrigation systems in the spring and they are set by the person who might do that and then they are left for the entire season until that person might return in the fall and blow out the system and then the clock is turned off. But what I want you to do is especially if we have a typical Colorado spring where we're going to get some precipitation, fingers crossed so we can have that rainy night, 
uh, I want to have you turn off your clock, especially when we're getting good amounts of precipitation. So learning where that on and off button is, is really, really key. Then as you get more used to your clock, you can actually start to turn it on and off also based on the temperatures outside, what time of year it is, and you can make adjustments that way. But definitely turn it off because we don't need to be watering when it's raining outside. We've all seen that happen and we don't need to be doing that. So tips on easy lawn watering. This is what you can do and you'll use clues. So you'll be actually visually looking at your lawn itself. One thing to look for is what we call footprinting. If you walk across the lawn, if the water is applied in the correct amounts, the lawn should be able to recover from your footprints within a short amount of time, usually an hour, maybe less. If the lawn is drought stressed, your footprints are going to remain. So you will see your footprints as you walk across the lawn. If you are seeing footprinting, you know that it's assigned to water your lawn. So that's a good visual clue. Another thing to look for is an off color. As lawns start to get uh, stressed out, and this is really on our cool season lawns, they might turn kind of an off color and maybe a little bit gray. So combine the grayish look with the footprinting. And then again, it's a good sign that you need to apply some irrigation. Here is the CSU campus and we love using campus as an example because they generally have a lot of things that they can improve upon. Uh, this is the Montfort quad and so over here is the animal sciences building. And this is a great example of when you know something is wrong with your irrigation system. So just looking at this picture, you'll notice that we have an area that is kind of that grayish brownish color. That's a sign of drought stress. And then we have this really bright green area which is perfectly watered. Uh, there's an irrigation head in the center of all of these green spots, but we have skips that are happening. So this is August. It's very obvious at this time of year, but you can even see this and extrapolate this to your smaller home lawn. So off color footprinting are all good signs. And that's when you know you need to water. So easy lawn watering, turn on your system and get an idea of how much you can water before it starts to run off. So we never want to see water coming down onto the sidewalk or going into our sewer drains. That's a sign that your soil, and this depends on your soil type, if you have a really heavy clay, it absorbs water very, very slowly. But basically turn on your system and let it run and then start to monitor heads that might be over spraying and then also see how much water you can put down in terms of minutes before it starts to run off. As soon as you see runoff, that's when you turn it off and that's when you know you need to adjust your clock. So if it starts to run off in six or eight minutes, which is very possible depending on the heads you have, you'll know that you'll need to adjust how much time you do. Otherwise you're just watering the sidewalks in the street, which don't need water and that's expensive. So once you kind of get an idea of how much water is needed, and again, this is going to adjust based on the heat in the time of year and if we get any natural precipitation, then you'll repeat that process. And so really, if you can manually operate your irrigation clock during the entire season, that is going to be ideal. So turn it on to water and then turn it off. See when you start seeing footprinting, see when you start seeing that grayish green color of the lawn, then you'll water again. And each time, make sure that you're applying as much water as you can before it runs off. So it really does depend on the time of the year and a lot does also depend on the type of sprinkler heads that you have. If you have persistent areas that are bare spots or perennially brown, then you'll know that you have an irrigation head problem and you can make adjustments that way. What time of day should you water? Well, absolutely follow your city and town ordinances. So if they say that you can only water on odd days, make sure that you're watering on odd days. If they say you cannot water between 9 and 6 p.m., make sure you're not running your sprinklers then because you can get ticketed and that's not a good thing. For the overall turf health, watering in the middle of the night is recommended. So sometime between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. And this might be news to you depending on where you grew up because there was a myth that watering at night actually led to more disease pressure. That has since been debunked and actually watering at night can wash off some of the sugars and some of the exudes that come out of the turf 
and less disease pressure actually occurs. Now, the problem with watering at night is more than likely you're asleep. And so it is a good idea a couple times a month to turn on the system uh, during the day, just to make sure that things aren't broken, you don't have a leaky head, just to make sure that things are operating. You'll probably know too, because you'll get a very large bill should one of those things occur. Uh, but water at night, pressure is better. We tend to have less wind, unless it's this week, and it just tends to be a better time to apply water to the lawn. How much should you water? And this is one of the publications that I will send to you following this presentation. This is a very basic lawn watering guide, but I also love it. The graphic is so helpful. So you're looking at number of days per week. And again, early spring and late fall, maybe one or two days a week because the temperatures are cooler. The lawn isn't growing as much as it is during the middle of the summer. And then you're going to water based on the type of heads that you have. I'll get into the type of lawn heads in just a second, but just know that spray heads or pop-up sprays put out a lot of water in a very short amount of time. So your cycles are going to be much less. If you compare that to rotors or stream rotors, which are the heads that move, rotors apply water really slowly. And so you need to apply them about three times as long as you would with pop-up sprays. Rotors, however, are far more efficient to water. So also keep that in mind. But you're going to increase the time based on the time of year and you can adjust it. So this is kind of a very basic way of watering. If you have slopes, if you have a mostly Southern exposure landscape, you are going to take those into consideration and potentially expand the watering times as needed. It also depends on what your expectations of a lawn are. If you want Augusta National, I don't know if I'd recommend that in Colorado, your expectations are much different than if you want a lawn that's mostly kind of sort of green. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And this also depends on the type of species of grass that you have as well. So let's cover the three main types of lawn sprinklers. So the first I mentioned is pop-up sprays. These are the heads that pop up and they spray, spray, spray constantly. They put out a lot of water in a very short amount of time. They tend to be installed because it's fairly inexpensive technology. So it's cheap heads. Um, and this might be what you get when you move into a new house. They also tend to be culprits of runoff because they put out so much water on, during a short time. So on slopes, especially these are potentially the worst heads that you can use just because our clay soils can only absorb about a tenth of an inch of water per hour and this just puts out too much for it to be absorbed. So that's the first type. The second is rotors and rotors, the technology, the head actually moves back and forth. Okay, rotors again are going to put out water really slowly over a long time period. So a general rule of thumb is that you want to run rotors for about 40 to 50 minutes. That will depend on the type of head. And this is where doing a quick sprinkler audit to collect the amount of water is going to be helpful. With rotors though, because they're putting out water so slowly, runoff is drastically reduced, which is a really good thing. But the heads themselves are more expensive. The last type is stream rotors. And these came on the market a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so. And this is the most efficient type of head with the most efficient technology. They're very similar to rotors in that they put out water really slowly. Their pattern though is like a finger. So you might see these where they have these fingers that put out water. The droplets are larger. And the good thing about that is that then that droplet can hit the surface of the turf and it doesn't evaporate or blow away. They provide very uniform watering, little runoff, and can be very expensive to install. But if you have a water district that supports uh, irrigation technology, you might get rebates if you swap some of your heads to stream rotors. There's a lot of places that offer rebates. So definitely look into your own city water district. And if you have pop-ups, you can easily replace the nozzle, just unscrew it and screw it back in with a stream rotor head and you will be watering much more efficiently. But again, you need to extend the watering time because these put out water much more slowly 
than your pop-up sprays. So this is just a way to swap it out. Really, you just unscrew the nozzle. Um, I've done this numerous times during some of my lawn checks where the homeowner doesn't, doesn't feel comfortable doing it, but you literally unscrew the old nozzle, you screw the new one in, and then you do have to do some adjustment on them. They do sell them for all major brands. So whether you're Toro or Hunter or Rainbird or Ewing, whatever technology you have, all of them have these stream rotors that you can purchase. And I would also recommend, I didn't write this down on the presentation, but if you swap out one head, do all of the heads in a zone. You can't leave one pop-up spray and swap out three others. Make sure you're like converting the entire zone. So just another example, all major brands, you can adjust them so you can buy them fully adjustable. They have a stop. This is where things get a little bit tedious, but once you do one or two, you kind of get the hang of it. So you would set your stop to where the edge of the sidewalk is or where you want it to water, but always with all sprinklers, you want to make sure you have head-to-head -head coverage. That's the most important thing is that you need to have overlapping sprinkler heads in order to have the most efficient use of your sprinkler system. But don't worry, there's videos online of how to do this. There's videos of how to set the angles and again, make sure that you're swapping all of the heads in one zone to the same type. So going back again to our lawn watering guide, again, it depends on the type of heads that you have. It also depends on the time of year and what kind of temperatures we're having. Should we have a very cool summer? You know, you wouldn't need to water as much. If your lawn is mostly shaded due to trees, you don't need to water as much. That's when you use those visual clues of footprinting. Uh, you can stab a screwdriver into the ground to see how far you can penetrate it down into the soil. And you can also look for a discoloration of the turf itself. So you're monitoring the turf as much as you can. And I mentioned how irrigation also depends on the species of turf you have. So if you have something other than Kentucky bluegrass, maybe you've converted to buffalo grass or blue grama or one of the other warm seasons, you are going to be watering much differently than you would if you had a bluegrass lawn. So for some of our cool season species like Kentucky bluegrass, annual bluegrass, they are going to need more irrigation than some of our warm season species. So supplemental irrigation, this is not what nature gives us, but what you are providing could be as much as 30 inches of year. And that would be on a high use, high density lawn. A lawn that gets a lot of foot traffic, whether it's from kids or pets or sports. And so a lot of our park areas or some of our sports complexes might be putting on that much water in order to get the lawn to recover from the traffic. If it's just a normal backyard, it gets occasional dog traffic, you'll get away with less. But again, it depends on what your expectations are. Buffalo grass and blue grama, that's going to be on the other end of the spectrum where these are native grasses. They have grown up in Colorado, and so they are used to having long periods of time without irrigation. But if these are species you're planting that are getting foot traffic, again, you will have to provide some supplemental irrigation to help them recover from the traffic. So a lot goes into the lawn's use, what you're using it for, and what your expectations of the turf are. You can also install soil moisture sensors, rain shutoff devices, wind sensors. These are all really good things. So if it is windy at night and your uh, barometer, not a barometer, the wind meter reader, um, signals that it's too windy to water where it could actually blow your irrigation. Um, that would be good technology to install. They do have soil moisture sensors that you actually put into the turf soil that will signal your irrigation clock to turn on and off depending on how moist the soil is. So you can set that to a level. This technology is becoming incredibly affordable. It used to be very expensive, but there's even a professor, Dr. Ham, here at CSU, who has soil moisture sensors that are just a few dollars that he hopes to release to the general public. Um, and that will make watering your vegetable gardens and your perennial beds and your lawn so much easier because some of these uh, components that you would attach to an irrigation clock can be very cumbersome and intimidating. I totally get that. Uh, so just know that there's huge strides going into landscape irrigation technology, 
what was on the market last year is definitely improved for this year. And so just keep an eye on those things. But smart technology is only as smart as the person operating the system and the person installing it. So make sure that you're either working with an individual who is very well aware of how to install and use this technology, but also that you're taking the time to understand how it works as well. So it's cool that you can turn on your sprinklers using Alexa or your smartphone, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be efficient in saving you water in the long run. So again, learn to turn your system on and off. That is number one, such an important thing. Um, if you're scheduled to water the lawn and we have to get a three quarter inch rainstorm for us to all celebrate, uh, but then go downstairs or in your garage, wherever it is, and make sure that you turn that off because your lawn doesn't need that much water. And overwatering can lead to a lot of disease problems as well. And I do want to go back because I realized I forgot to talk about soak cycles. And so soak cycles, uh, you may have heard of, but you'll see down here at the bottom where it says two cycles of eight minutes. Essentially what that means is that you will be watering a total of 16 minutes. But what we encourage you to do is split that into two or even three, depending on your percolation rate. So you would run the system for eight minutes, do all of the zones in your lawn and landscape, and then come back and cycle through a second time and apply another eight minutes of irrigation. What that does is it allows that first application of water to move down into the soil. And then the second application of water not only prevents runoff, but it helps push that down further into the root system. So soak cycles are going to be your best friend and having an irrigation clock that can do that is absolutely key as well. So your clock, this is just an example, I'm not promoting Rainbird. There are so many different clocks out there, but basically the, the clock should have these components. It should have an interval or day of the week option. So right here, as you'll see the days, where it's lit up in green are the days that you want to water. There should be a station for each zone. So this has four zones where you can water. It should have the ability to soak cycle, which I just talked about, and that's this button here, the cyclic watering. Seasonal adjustment is maybe where you can hit that button and it will water less in the spring and a little bit more in the summer months. And then if you have the capability, have rain or wind shut off sensors to tell the clock to turn off if it's experiencing any of those weather events. And another point, so while you have someone who can help you install the technology, if you have a really terrible irrigation system, a new clock, putting in moisture sensors, putting in a rain shutoff device, it's not going to fix a badly designed irrigation system or heads that are crooked. So you do need to get down and dirty with your heads and make sure that they are popping up straight, that they're coming out of the ground, that you are adjusting for any heads that are geysers, any heads that are buried, make sure that you're pulling those out. And if you have a head that got mowed off, like this one on campus, make sure that you are replacing that as well. So good technology does not replace doing some annual maintenance with your sprinkler system. Also consider an audit. Uh, I mentioned this and this is a publication that Amy will post into the chat and will also send out this document. So don't feel that you need to save it. But the benefits of an irrigation audit actually tells you how much water you're applying. So if you water for 30 minutes, my first question to you will be, well, how much water are you putting down? I don't know, I water for 30 minutes. You need to collect that water so that you have an idea. Then you can go back to the chart and kind of plan on that inch or so of water during the heat of summer. It also gives you the ability to look at your heads nice and closely, observe heads that need adjustment. So flag them or mark them in some way where you can go back and make those adjustments. And collecting the water will help you diagnose those problem areas that have been happening for more than one season. And I will guarantee you, when you turn on your system, it looks like water is going everywhere, but you don't know until you actually collect using cups or something else. So this is what an irrigation audit looks like. These are actual audit cups. You don't need to use these if you have tuna cans or Chobani yogurt cups or cat food tins, whatever you have on hand that is the same shape and, shape and size, use those. 
you'll put out eight to 12 in a zone. So make sure you're focusing on one zone at a time and put the cups in areas that look good and in areas that don't look so good. Then run the system for 15 to 20 minutes. Whatever you run it for, just make sure that you're collecting enough water in the cup. So looking at what we collected here, this was a client that we worked with, the area that was brown, you can see, so we have a head and when this head is running, it looks like it's hitting this area, but this cup was only collecting a tenth of an inch versus a cup just a few feet away that was collecting two tenths of an inch. And you might think, yeah, it's not a big deal. You know, it's pretty close, but really it's twice as much water. So then extrapolate that to a week to a growing season, to two years. And so this area that's getting two tenths of an inch every time you water is getting twice as much water as the other area. And over time, that could lead to inches of water, which is why this area is drought stress. So think of that. Again, you need to physically collect the water in order to determine if it is a sprinkler issue. What we always encourage people to do is to first rule out irrigation as the cause of what is wrong with your lawn because more likely than not, Tony estimates 90 to 95% of turf problems are related in some way to irrigation. It's a good thing to rule out. Then we can focus on that other 5% of what it could be. Uh, so that publication that Amy will paste in the chat and that we'll send to you really tells you how to do an irrigation audit. It's a good tool. It doesn't take a ton of time. You might live in a water district that actually provides this service free. And if that's the case, get on the list to make sure that you get your sprinklers audited uh, this summer. I'm going to pause there and ask Amy or Tony if there are any questions that I can answer or need clarification on. Well, I was just I was just starting to type a uh, a response to I think it's uh, let's see Jack talking about uh, his question was you have trees and turf growing together and they're very large mature trees how do you know how much water the tree gets and how much the lawn gets and what I was going to tell him is as long as you're watering enough that the lawn looks good you're probably watering enough for the trees and the turf that's that that's what I was going to tell you jack but if you want to I elaborate would, yeah no i would agree and so jack that's a great question and it's really hard to research this because there's so many compounding factors in trying to identify it the best data we have is is about a 50 50 split so the tree is benefiting from about 50 percent of the water and the lawn is benefiting from about 50 percent but i absolutely love tony's recommendation is to water enough to keep the turf healthy um, and then the, the tree is going to benefit as well. Uh, for those of you who are looking to maybe convert your turf or to reduce the amount of water that you're putting on the lawn, always think about your mature trees because they are not easily replaced and they have grown accustomed to the regular watering that you're applying with your lawn. So with conversions or if you're changing your turf to something else, xeriscape or a different type of grass, if these are not drought tolerant trees or native trees to Colorado, they will need supplemental irrigation using drip lines or soaker hoses or something to keep them healthy. We have seen too many tragic examples of trees that have died because of lack of water. Yeah, Amy. So there's been another question in, could you just clarify how long is it minutes or hours between those soak cycles? Well, that's a great question. And you know, it's hard to say depending on how many zones you have. I would say, and I don't know if there's a recommendation, Tony, but it may be an hour or so between as a minimum, um, but definitely try to soak cycle during a watering evening. Tony, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, yeah, one one to two hours. But again, it, it, may, take, it may take even longer than that to get through all your stations. If you've got 10 stations that have a large landscape, it might be two hours. So, but yeah, one to two hours somewhere in there is sufficient. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to drip irrigation. So, drip irrigation is commonly seen in landscape beds, in vegetable beds, anywhere where you're maybe doing pinpoint irrigation. Um, and drip can be a really friendly thing, but it is not without its share of problems. So, we'll talk about all of that. 
Drip irrigation is sometimes called micro irrigation and it is an incredibly efficient way to water. So that is a good thing. Um, doing overhead irrigation in a vegetable garden can lead to a lot of disease pressure. It can lead to increased insects. And so definitely watering at the base is a good thing to consider. So with drip irrigation, you're doing targeted water application because usually the line is very near or close to the plant that you're trying to water. Incredibly efficient. If our sprinkler systems, the best estimates, the best ones are maybe 60 to 70% efficient. Some of the worst ones are below that amount. But with drip irrigation, you're getting about 90% efficiency. So that is a huge bonus to using uh, drip irrigation. Total total water use, it's a low pressure system. So that's good if you don't have the best pressure coming out of your hose lines, or if there's too much draw in your neighborhood, this can be a benefit. Um, and you'll get fewer weeds and disease because again, you're only watering usually immediately near the plant itself. And so this area isn't getting water. And so weeds generally won't grow in that spot. Weeds are going to grow, they're opportunists where there's water and nutrients available. So just a couple more pictures of using drip irrigation in the vegetable garden, and we'll go into the two different types of inline and then spot emitters. The thing to know about drip irrigation is the successfulness of it uh, depends on capillarity. So basically capillarity is how that water spreads in the soil. Your soil type is really going to determine how capillarity uh, works. And I do have a graphic, but basically if you have a clayey soil, it's going to be more of a surface spreading versus a sandy soil because sandy um, particles are larger. And so it's going to go down deeper, but not spread as much on the surface. But that's how drip irrigation works. And this is such a great photo of what it looks like when you run the drip system. So you can kind of get an idea of how long to run it in order to thoroughly saturate the soil profile of whatever you're watering. So there is greater capillarity or spreading with sandy soils um, and deeper movement in sandy soils. So uh, it depends on where you live, depends on the type of um, soils that you have. And of course, your vegetable gardens, which are likely not native soils, are going to be different than your landscape beds, which are probably more native soils. So just keep that in mind. And when you first install the drip system, you can run it and get an idea of how much spreading you might get based on the soil types. And then you're going to use your favorite tool, your finger, to stick it in and kind of determine how moist that area is. Um, so keep that in mind. It's again a very hands-on thing and this is where it's fun to get dirty in the garden. So one of the type of drip emitters are called line source emitters or inline emitters. And essentially what this is is that you have this polytubing and within that polytubing you have an emitter. And so you can kind of see this swollen area, but so that is the emitter itself. These are lines that you would then run out. Um, so if you have a landscape bed with new plants, you could run these lines up and down the landscape bed. They're easy to install. You would probably use some of the fabric clamps to keep them in place. They're really good for rows. And so if you have a vegetable garden, putting them in rows is very easy to do. And the emitters are regularly spaced. So the emitters are maybe on six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, or 24. So it will depend on what you, plants you have and the spacing of the plants itself. They last a long time. Um, what's great is again, it's a low pressure system. So no matter what the pressure is at the beginning of the line, it's going to be the same at the end. That's a good thing. And again, fewer weeds and disease. The technology of these inline emitters is pretty darn cool, I have to say. So this is a you know graphic of what it looks like. Um, it helps regulate it. And so if it says it's only 0.4 gallons per hour, it is regulated. So it doesn't do more than that. But the technology is awesome. You are paying quite a bit for some of these. So um, these were just things I pulled off of Amazon or a landscape supplier website. And what you'll need to know is what you want your spacing to be for those emitters themselves. 
and then also what amount of water you want to come out of the emitters. So for a vegetable garden, you're probably looking at something more like a gallon per hour versus a water-wise landscape. Um, perennials and natives, that's maybe 0.4 gallons per hour. This is kind of hard to determine because this is all kind of new information. So you can talk to landscape suppliers, you can contact your extension office, um, but you can see what the price is. So 500 feet for about $56. So um, that is one of the options to consider. The other is point source emitters. And so what you do is you will buy the emitter itself. So these are all different types of emitters with different gallons per hour heads. Uh, and then you buy black poly or brown poly, just tubing, and then you are actually going to create the point where you want to water and put your point source emitter into that place. So this provides you a lot more flexibility. If you have a vegetable garden where you grow different plants every year, that tends to be me, you can run new lines and then actually decide where you want that emitter to be located based on where you plant your plants for that season. Uh, these are very reliable. They're resistant to plugging. That's a big thing. Um, they're also really good for individual plants or containers. And so you might see these with spaghetti tubing. So they come off a main line and then they have the spaghetti tubing. Uh, that can work. They come in a variety of flow rates. So make sure that you're buying the right ones. They can be expensive because you're buying individual emitters. And if you step on them or have a curious beagle who is in the garden with you, they can easily break off, which is not cool. Um, but that does happen. Uh, so here's just a couple examples. Again, here is your main line, your, your brown or black poly. And then you are going to punch a hole with a tool into that area. And if you have an eggplant or a tomato located near there, that is where you would then put your emitter. So instead of having it on an evenly spaced design with the inline that we just talked about, this is pinpointed and you can then design your drip irrigation based on the garden that you're planting. The hole punch tool is going to be your best friend, so make sure you invest in one of those. They're very inexpensive. Punch it into the tubing itself and then you are going to insert the drip um, emitter into the hole that you just punched. And one thing that you'll want to definitely get are goof plugs. This is the actual name of these. So let's say you make a mistake and you plant something else, or maybe you don't want an emitter in that spot. These goof plugs are what you then use to plug any holes that you punch. So you can actually use your uh, line tubing for a couple of seasons if you go in and plug your previous holes if you have new places that you are going to plant. So goof plugs, they're cheap, they are essential, um, but it is a fun thing to do. So if you like building Legos, if you like doing Tinker Toys, putting together drip irrigation is actually kind of a thrill because it involves that part of your brain. Um, you can also do this for your individual containers. So if you have a bunch of containers on your patio, you could have a main line and then run a spaghetti tube that is going to then water your container if that's not something that you want to do every day with a hose and sprinkler. So drip irrigation is really useful. It is very uh, flexible, which is an important thing, and it can be attached to hoses as well. So what about drip irrigation kits? They sell these. They're great for beginners. And so if you are new to drip irrigation, you're not really sure how to approach it, you're not sure what to buy, you can absolutely buy these kits. You will always end up with more parts than you'll use. So if you do put together Legos and you have that one weird Lego left over, you're going to have that with these drip irrigation kits. It's a little bit of a no brainer approach, but if you're not sure what you need, instead of going to the hardware store or box store every 10 minutes because you forgot an elbow or you need to get a new type of plug, this is a kit that can help you. And this stuff saves year after year. So that is a good thing. You get a nice bucket out of it, but once you do it for a season or two, you'll get used to knowing exactly what you need, and then you can go from there and buy it. There are timers that you can attach to your outdoor hose to control drip systems. They are awesome. They are water resistant, which is really good. And you can set them. So they're battery operated. You would attach it to the main line of your hose and then attach your drip line as you need to. 
They have some that are actually splitters. And so if you use your hose to fill a dog's bowl or something, you might need to have that on a separate line, but then you can run your drip irrigation to the hose and have those spigots turned on with the timer set to then water as you need to. And some of them have multiple zones. So if you have different raised beds, you could have a separate line running to each of the raised beds. You could have a line running to your containers. So there's a lot of different options. And again, these battery operated timers, they're readily available. Um, do make sure, this is one thing, do make sure that you are unscrewing them if there's any chance of potential frost. The technology in here uh, can be easily damaged. And so if we get into a 35 degree night, I would unscrew that so you don't waste $53 on that kit. And drip irrigation really is great. It's not perfect. Uh, this is a landscape that I visited and all of the plants, it was a new landscape. All of the plants looked bad. They were not thriving. And what we found is that they had never rooted and they were actually rotting in their holes. So this was being watered by a drip irrigation system that had been set to water new plants, but it had never been adjusted after the fact. And so these plants were essentially drowning. So this is a typical Colorado soil where it doesn't drain very well. Um, and it was just absolutely filled up with water. So the problem with drip is that we generally have it under either landscape fabric, that's another story, or mulch. And so it's not easy to see when things are broken or not working, or if it's even operating, it's really, really hard. So drip irrigation is great in terms of efficiency and ease, but it doesn't make maintenance any easier. Uh, so keep those things in, in mind. So it's great, but not perfect. This was another system. You can actually see the break on the main line right there. You can see that it's cracked. Uh, this was in a landscape in a grocery store parking lot. And this is just, this is the worst waste of water. And this happens every single time the system is turned down. Now, I would hope that in any home landscape, you would notice this immediately. But on some commercial sites, they may not be visited all that much. They may not come at the right time of day to actually see this happen. And so this is where a lot of wasted water can occur. So keep that in mind that if you have a really wet spot or your plants aren't thriving, go back and check the drip to see if there's some adjustments that you can make. Uh, this was a great example. So here we have the drip underneath the landscape fabric, which we generally don't recommend. This is one of the reasons, uh, but this is Zauchinaria, so the hummingbird trumpet, a great xeric plant. Uh, but what you can see here is that the line was cut in half. So maybe a shovel sliced that open, um, but underneath all of this uh, was just a soggy, soggy mess. And so um, this is where it's almost impossible to really find the point of break or really try to do maintenance on this until you until something really significant happens. And so the plant may start to suffer. You might have an, an extreme water bill that you never anticipated. And then you have to go and hunt down where that break might be and make adjustments to that area. So just know that drip isn't perfect. It has its pros, but it does have its cons as well. Moving on to soaker hoses. They are inexpensive. They're very easy to install. So you just lay them out and they're also called leaky hoses or leaky pipe hoses because they essentially ooze water. They apply water really, really slowly, which is wonderful. The unfortunate thing is that they usually don't last that long. Uh, they tend to break down. So they might last a season, maybe two, um, but if they're exposed to UV in any way, they tend to crack and break down. They also can plug which doesn't usually happen with drip irrigation. Um, so if you don't have the best water or if you're maybe using non-potable water in your landscape, they might clog more easily. Um, they also, they're not as uniform or efficient because where the line starts, where you're plugging it into your hose bib is going to have better water pressure than at the end. So unlike drip irrigation, which helps regulate some of those pressure differences, soaker hoses don't have that adjustment. So just know that the end of the line could provide very little water while the beginning of the line could be better. Um, and they're difficult to repair. We actually talked about this with our master gardeners not long ago. 
people had done some heroic things with tape and trying to fix it. Um, I guess you could see it as a short-term investment. There's an area that you just need to water or maybe to water your trees in, in times of extreme drought, that could be a great use for them. Um, I just don't know the permanency of using soaker hoses in the landscape. So just keep that in mind. Now, for those of you who are watering by hand, you are the most efficient waters. We affectionately call you the hose draggers. Uh, this is not a bad thing. I am a hose dragger in all of my landscape beds. I don't have drips in those beds. And so I just put out a hose and sprinkler as needed. And it's extremely efficient because you are dedicating yourself to water those areas and you're the one moving them and you're the one monitoring the water as well. So you can do an audit with your hose and sprinklers. You can put out cups just like you would with your in-ground sprinkler system and find a hose and sprinkler that works for you. I have always struggled setting these type of back and forth sprinklers and now they have technology where it makes it so easy and it makes me extremely happy. So oscillating types, here's kind of the older technology that I can never figure out how to work. The newer types have these little knobs and you just move those back and forth to determine how far it goes in either direction. And they have one where it squeezes in. So if you want a really narrow type of spray, you can do that as well. So oscillating types, they're going to put out water really slowly. And remember each half is only getting half of the water you apply. So you might need to run them longer than you expect. But again, put out some cups and then collect it. You might have a traveling tractor. Um, this is what my mom used growing up in Minnesota. She would snake her hose out and then have the tractor run along the hose line. And this can be also really efficient. So adjust these bars that are going to put out water um, because they can move and sometimes they actually blast off. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, but this is a nice way to water a larger part of the landscape. And again, it creeps really slowly along the hose itself, uh, but it is an option. They are not inexpensive though, they tend to be a fairly big investment. Your impact sprinklers are what brings me back to childhood. These are the ones that, those are the impact sprinklers. This is another one that I have struggled with to set. Uh, but again, impact sprinklers do work. For the most part, you are going to be watering a certain area. Um, and so they don't go all the way around for the most part. So make sure that you're setting them. I think they're a little finicky to make sure that you're not getting that overspray, uh, but they can absolutely work. And there are some in-ground irrigation systems that have this type of technology. They tend to be older heads, uh, but they might have the impact type of spray pattern. Spot sprinklers are something every gardener should have. This is great for newly planted trees and shrubs when you just want to water one or two plants, they're not going to cover a huge area. Um, but I find these to be great to water trees, especially younger trees during the winter months. Um, so you can put those near the base of the tree or near the trunk and then um, set them and adjust the flow or how much water they're putting out. Um, they do tend to put out quite a bit of water. So again, you could collect the water to get an estimate. They do have gallon readers that you can buy that you would put on the end of your hose before you attach it to the sprinkler. So you can get an idea of how many gallons of water that you're using. Um, but these are just great. They're very inexpensive, just a few dollars each, and they can water a small area. So highly recommend the spot sprinklers. And then for everything else, for your containers, for maybe areas that you want to water, never just use a hose without some sort of attachment on the end that can be a waste of water. So do put a watering wand or a spray gun on there. Of course, they have them where they are ergonomic. That's important. Uh, the watering wands come in different sizes. They also have ones with heads that you can adjust and rotate. So if you have hanging baskets, you can get one that has more of a crook neck that will actually target water to the top of the container itself. And then you can play with the different settings on there. So if you want to mist things, maybe you're starting some seeds inside, that would be a good use for it. There's the shower, there's the jet, if you have to blast something off the side of your house for some reason. Um, but these are important. And again, 
they help regulate water so that you just don't have a loose hose that is constantly running. That's a big thing as well. You can also entertain the kids, the grandkids, the neighborhood kids with many different types of watering materials. If I had this growing up, I probably would have never left home because <laughs> it's so much fun. Uh, but do put these on your lawn because it will provide some water, which is really good. And it is a way that you can also entertain the kids and have some fun as well. Yeah, I need that giraffe too, I agree. So with that, I'll end with any questions. Um, my email address is there, but I welcome Amy and Tony back on uh, to help me with any questions I missed or anything that I need to clarify in the last couple of minutes. I'm something, something uh, mainly because I wasn't paying attention to you. No, I was answering the question, so I may have missed this. Um, did you talk about, um, maybe reducing run times on stations by a minute oh, or so? No, that's a great, thank you, Tony. So if you're looking to just save some water and if you're a part of an HOA or a larger area, uh, one tip that we love to give to people is an easy way to save 10% of your water use is to reduce run times by 10%. So if you're running your system for 30 minutes, drop it by three minutes. So go from 30 minutes to 27 minutes, that's 10%. And that will save you 10% of water over a growing season. Guaranteed, you will not notice a difference between 30 minutes and 27 minutes. Then what you can do is you can keep reducing it and see how far you can push things before either you hate the look of the lawn or the neighbors and your HOA start getting upset, but you can kind of adjust it then. So start with 10%, if you can stretch it to 20%, that's great, but again, any sort of tasks or tips that you can do to save water are going to be beneficial in the long run. Allison, I'm not sure if you covered it or not, um, but do you recommend burying drip lines or leaving them on the surface of the soil? You know, for ease of maintenance, leaving them on the surface of the soil is ideal, but they look bad. So maybe put them under a thin layer of mulch, but I wouldn't bury them under rock or landscape fabric with mulch on top. It would just be so hard to maintain them. That, and that comes down to an aesthetics thing that you'll have to decide. Now that, that little, that thin brown inline emitter stuff, you never want to bury it under the soil. The spaghetti tubing? Well, the, the inline stuff, yeah. Oh, the yeah. inline stuff. There you go. Yeah. yeah you never, you never want to bury that, but under mulch is fine. Yeah. yeah. Or under plastic, under yeah. plastic mulch in a vegetable garden is fine. One other thing that came up in the chat is, um, if you're using drip tape or you're using the, the tubing that has the small micro holes in it, and you want those facing upward. The pressure of the water is going to push the water out through the top. If they are facing downward which some of us might think that makes more sense. Um, if there's any debris in the line, it can settle down into those holes and clog them up. So you want those, those drip tape holes facing upward. Thank you, Amy, that's a really good point. 